Well, greetings. Welcome to Crossroads Baptist Church for our Wednesday, December 8th midweek devotion. Thank you for joining me. We've had a few weeks off and I'm ready to get back in the side on cover Romans chapter 13. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I just want to thank you so much for being so good to your people, dear Lord. During this time of year, dear Lord, normally we get a little bit busy and Lord, um, rush sometimes dear lord and anxiety for many people lord and i pray that you would just um, comfort the believer today dear lord to be reminded that you're in control dear lord thank you for the blessings you have given your people dear lord for the way you have blessed this congregation in this ministry dear lord and i pray for our congregation the friends of this uh church dear lord and our members lord and i pray that you'd be with each family member of those that are represented here and lord thank you for your great love for us Lord, I pray that you'd be with us to this devotion. Dear Lord, speak to the hearer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A few announcements I want to share with you. Of course, this week will be week three of Advent. We'll be uh, recognizing joy. And, of course, our sermon will coincide with that. We're continuing our Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. Please be uh, prayerful uh, with that, the, uh, what the Lord would have you to give. Also, we're um, taking up money for Broken Wings ministry here locally in Farmerville to help them with their expenses throughout the year, um, a one-time gift. If, uh, if you feel uh, led to give to that, please give and just mark your tithe there with um, Broken Wings Ministry. December 19th is a big day here at the church. We'll have our children singing Christmas specials. Uh, this Sunday, um, Sunday school at 9.30, our children will have choir practice at 10. And then the next Sunday, December 19th, our children will sing three Christmas songs for us. We'll have other special music. be a great time to be a part of our, our um, worship service here during this Christmas season. So mark that on your calendars. And then also that Sunday, December 19th at 4 p.m. will be our Lottie Moon Christmas auction. Bring a wrapped Christmas present. We'll auction it off. All the money goes to Lottie Moon International Missions is, uh, and bring some finger foods. It's a great time of fellowship. And it's also a great time to raise money for international missions. Romans chapter 13. And I kind of want to finish the book of Romans um, this month, a couple more uh, weeks. And, of course, we'll take the, the last part of this month off. But Paul, being the, the, the great apostle, the great missionary that he is, he continues to teach us about um, um, that we're, we, we shouldn't be boastful. He continues to teach us that that the sacrifice that was given on Calvary by Jesus Christ was for not just the Jews, but the Gentiles too. It was for the entire world. And whenever we accept that, reading through the book of Romans, we, there's a, several things that we can uh, dwell upon. And that is that salvation is made available to anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. And God's great knowledge and his great providence, he knows who will and who will not. But my belief is, is that the sacrifice that Christ made is acceptable to God for all mankind. Will all accept? No, they won't. But it's not because the sacrifice was not enough for them. It's just simply because in God's great knowledge, he knows who will and who won't throughout all time, from the very beginning until the very end. So what we begin here in, in Romans chapter 13, <clears throat> Paul talks about something that many of us may have a pro a difficulty with uh, during this time of the uh, of the, the the season that we're in, and that is with government officials and rules that are that are given to us. So let's begin reading here these first two or three verses. Let everyone be subject by the governed authorities. And keep in mind, Paul is addressing this because it's a problem in their time. And indeed, uh, crossing the 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 biblical bridge to our time today is a problem today too. Let everyone be subject to the governed authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. That's a great reminder. Consequently, whoever re rebels against the authority is rebelling against uh, God. Is, is rebelling against what has been set up by God. Um, is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. What Paul is doing here, very bluntly, is discussing the, 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 the sanction of government that God has allowed or that God has put into place, and Christians, just like every other person on this earth, are subject or should be subject to the governed authorities. And what we need to be reminded of as believers that allegiance to God 
does not neglect our responsibilities to the secular authority. We have seen in years past that um, religious groups, I'll, I'll use the word religious, they have secluded themselves, they have set up their own type of um, uh, government, and, and in the long run, many, if many, turn out to be anarchies, and they rebel against the government, and it's a, it's a, a, a bad deal. And, and Paul reminds us here that God has established authority in the world that we live in today. Does it trump God's authority? No, it does not. But we're to live as Christians under these governed authorities until that time when it does uh, try to overstep God's authority. And Paul is wanting to ensure the Christians that as good citizens were to avoid civic type of conflict or government type of conflict. That's a lot to say. Does that mean that we do not um, protest against abortion? No, I don't think so. I believe that we as believers and as Christians, that uh, we, we should be pro-life. I believe that there is a, a strong biblical indication that we should be pro-life. And I believe that we should stand up for that. Should we bomb abortion centers? I think that's a little extreme. And I think then we begin to go against God's law for the acts that would follow that. But what we see here is the authority that God has put into place or allowed to be put into place, we're to observe it, we're to recognize it and abide by it as long as it doesn't overtake what God has already said. In, in the first verse, let everyone be subject to the higher powers or the governing authorities. And even in the biblical times, there were th those governments or rulers that were typically not Christians. Now, I'm not saying that's a reflection of our rulers and leaders today, but it could be in many instances. And we have to recognize that God has allowed this type of institution to be put into place. We see the examples throughout, uh, especially the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, Nero, um, city treasurers who, who, were, who were not believers, who rejected God. God rejected Jesus Christ, but yet God allowed them into power. And matter of fact, God even used them on many instances. And we have to see that, that even if we cannot so uh, quote unquote respect the person as their morals, we need to respect the authority that God has allowed them to have. And we need to respect that God ordained office or position that has been set into place. And what this does is, 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 is a practice of faith for the believer that God has it all under control. We talk about it each and every Sunday almost. We say, you know what, we shouldn't be surprised about what we see in the news. We shouldn't be surprised about the events that are taking place in our own community, in our own state, in our own region. But the ultimate allegiance lies in our faith to God that he has it all under control. Is everything going by God's plan. No, but God knows what is taking place. If everything was going by God's plan, every man would be saved. And there would be no evil. There would be no murder. There would be no abortion. There would be no acts against God's uh, law or expectation. So, yes, we know we need to observe that even if officials are in governing powers and they're not believers or non believers, that we're still to recognize and still to abide by them. But they have authority that God has allowed and Paul reminds us of that. That we as Christians we have a, a right, we have a obligation to abide under those types of rules. There's several things that come to mind. Number one is what kind of example would we be if we were not abiding the law of the land? What kind of example would we be as a Christian if we're not doing the things that are expected of us by the legal authorities that have been set into place that God has allowed to be in place. We're to be good examples, good stewards of our community. Um, we shouldn't throw our trash in the ditch, okay? It is, it's against the law for one, but it's, a, it's, it's not becoming of a Christian. Does the Bible say thou shalt not trash the ditches. Well, no, but I mean, it's common sense that this is not something becoming of a man of God. So therefore, Paul is addressing this in quite open terms that we should be reminded. Now, if those who are in authority, if it follows one who resists authority 
is resisting what God has ordained. So what I'm saying here is, is that if we resist authority, we're resisting what God has allowed, and it's not a manner becoming of a Christian, and it is rebellion against God's authority or the authority that God has given. Now, when you think about it like that, you know, we say, well, you know, we're not really lawbreakers. We don't really, you know, cause a bunch of ruckus with the government. Well, there are some who do, and we need to be reminded that any, um, any, um, Offense to that to those in in a th in authority is um is rebellion against God because God has allowed it into power. I say that, but let's let's talk a little bit more about it. It's a dangerous thing to oppose what God has allowed to happen or to oppose what God has put into place. Um, going forward, we need to do what is right. We need to do what God has asked us to do, and that is to obey authority. And, and verse 2 says, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do will bring judgment on themselves. So there is a repercussion to not doing what God, not honoring what God has allowed. Obviously, this is not the case in every instance, and we can turn to God's word, especially the book of Acts, for two instances when man, God's apostles, God's followers have said, you know what, this is against what God has said. And I want to show you just a little bit here um, that the government sometimes oversteps its rightful place. And it begins to be a uh, overstep what God has allowed. It begins to, um, to do things that God does not like or uh, um, that God condemns. Does that happen in our government today? Yeah. I believe we're, we're, we're in the middle of some Supreme Court hearings right now that that is um, uh, touching on these same types of, of basis. And there's two clear examples where civil disobedience is found, and it's found in the book of Acts. When Peter and John were told by the Sanhedrin not to preach in the name of Jesus, Acts chapter 4, they replied, Judge for yourself whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. And then they go to jail. And then upon being released, they, they resume their work. They go right back to preaching Jesus. And consequently, they're taken right back into custody in Acts chapter 5. And, they, and they, they simply say, we must obey God rather than man. You know, we have a, a spiritual obligation to obey what God says to do. To seek his word, to allow the Holy Spirit to move within our life and direct our thoughts to direct our allegiances and to direct who we are as Christians. When we deal with local civic governments, we have to be very careful that we're obeying two things here. The first thing is we need to be careful that we're obeying and observing what God has ordained and what God has allowed to take place. The second thing is we need to be very careful that we're not doing things that are against God's rule. 20 or 30 years ago in our society today, we would say, you know what, our, maybe even further than that, our, our, our governments pretty much adhere to the Christian values they were founded on. In biblical days, they were burning and killing Christians, so quite naturally this was going against what God liked and what God wanted. So Paul says, you know, hey, um, you know, there's some things that go on that, that leaders overstep and they're, 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 they're doing what God does not like. But now, even in our days today, we see the same types of things taking place. So we have to be very careful to uh, where our allegiance falls and what we're willing to support and what we're willing and what we should not be supporting. Let's look at verse um, 8. Let no man remain, let no debt remain outstanding. The greatest thing here that we have is to love our neighbors. And this is what he's, what he's talking about. Accept the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You should not, you should not steal. You should not covet. And whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. 
A Christian is to allow no debt to remain outstanding except the one that can never be paid, and that is a continual love of one another. And keep in mind, there is no obligation or no limit to that type of love we're to show one another. And when we show love to one another, they may not always be Christians. <clears throat> they may not always be believers. We're to ex exhibit a type of love to a world that is not on God's side in many times. Keep in mind what we said about the, with those in authority, especially during the biblical days. Most of the time, those who were in authority were not believers. And we see that sometimes in our day in society today. We say, how could they be believers by the way that they rule and the decisions that they make? Well, there again, we're to have a love for one another and we're to exhibit that love to one another. Have you ever met those type of people that are hard to love? I know I'm not the only one. Well, they're there. This is the world that we live in. And the great command here that all these other commands fall under, thou shalt not commit adultery, murder, steal, thou shalt not covet. They all fall under the instructions to love your neighbor as yourself. This falls within the family of God, of our fellow man. It also extends to the non-believer and those who are out of touch with the Lord, those who are in rebellion. And obviously, love will take different forms depending on who we're dealing with or the recipient of that love, but we're to place their, the love or their, their welfare, their well-being above our own. When we do that, we are truly showing the love of Christ because as our great example that he is, he showed his love for sinful man above his own when he died on the cross for our sins. That's what we're getting at today. He did that for, for me, and he did that for you. And it all began in the manger in Bethlehem when God sent his son Jesus from the very beginning, this was the plan, that he would die for man and die for man's sins. The command here is, you shall not commit adultery, you should not commit murder, you should not steal. And these, in verse 9 explains in, the, in this statement that above all these other commands, adultery, murder, theft, um, envy, covenantness, it's all summed up in the second great command to love your neighbors as yourself. Just as Jesus taught with the parable of the Good Samaritan, our neighbor is anyone that we encounter along life's road. And yes, sometimes that road is long. And sometimes we meet those types of people along the journey who are not the most lovable, who are not the, the best of people in our sight, but we're to love them and inevitably, hopefully, they will be touched by the love that we're displaying through our life. Let me get ready to close this here in verse 11. And do this, understanding the present time. So what he says is, in the end times, there's two things that's going to be difficult to do. Obeying the government, because the government is going to begin to, in most cases, show a, a worldly type of stance. And also, men may become harder to love. And he addresses the two points and he says, understanding that the time is near, that the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is near than when we first believed. In other words, Jesus Christ is coming back. The end is near. Church, it's time to live like we're Christians. And there should be a definite difference between us and the world. He says again, the night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently, decently as in the daytime, not as in carousing or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or debauchery, not in dissension or jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The need to love is supremely important and very important in this critical age that we're living in right now, which Paul tells us is the last days. Here we are. This is it. This is where we find ourselves today. And Paul wrote about this time that we're living in. It's drawing near. 
Church, we're closer today than we've ever been to the end, and we need to be remembered. The world lives as though human history will continue forever and ever, and the believer, the Christian, knows that this is not true, and this is our message to the world. The end is drawing near. And this is what Paul says here. He says, number one, Christians, wake up. Wake up and be the Christian that God has called you to be. Let it be seen through your acts in the community, through you know, obeying what God has allowed the government to be in place. But be very mindful that God is the superior authority. And then number two, let a love show through your heart that we're showing love to one another. Many people don't know the name Edwin Cooper. If you ask anybody who Edwin Cooper is, many people wouldn't know. But who is he? I'll tell you who he is. Many times he was in the 1940s and 50s. He was on TV a lot, and he, his, his stage name was Bozo the Clown, Edwin Cooper. And among his friends and, and cast members and those who he was around all the time, he always told his cast members, go get checked for cancer. Go to the doctor if you got any type of skin lesion or bump that comes up on you. If you have a pain or anything like that, go to the doctor, let them check you for cancer. Well, he gave all this good advice, but he didn't take the advice for himself and he died with cancer because his cancer, when it was found, was so far advanced and so far along that nothing could be done. Church, that's the way sin is. And Paul is telling us, church, be ready. Live as if today is your last day. Show love to your neighbor. Be mindful of the government that God has allowed or God has set into place. Be mindful of what, what their role is in the world that we live in today. Show love to, to those who are unlovable. Show love to our fellow man, those within the church, especially right now during the giving season. Let your love, let your Christian love be shown to others. And that's what he's saying here in the final word that Paul, the final, final word or advice that Paul gives here is the counsel that the believers should be, should take every opportunity to love, to love the, uh, the lost, to love our neighbor. And we should be mindful to turn away from evil desires, especially, especially in the last days, that we should not stoop down to the lower nature of the things of this world, but we should shine bright and shine. It says, clothe ourselves with the light. Do not flirt with the darkness. Now more than ever, Satan has has has, has called the call. He has, he has gathered together gather, gather his demons to make a, a frontal assault on the Christian today. And he will take our weaknesses, our bad habits, our old habits, and, and attack us. And Paul says, put on Jesus Christ, take off the world, take off the old clothing, and live for Christ as if you've never lived for him before, and let it be seen. Our appetite for sin needs to be diminished, and it will be diminished by putting on the light of Jesus Christ. In these glorious last days, we need a transformation of the believer that we're living like Christ, that we're being the Christ-centered apostle, the Christ-centered disciple that God has called us to be, and our evil desires and evil de de uh, intentions should fade away now more than ever. And by doing that, we'll show a love to the world. We'll show a love through our lives that is unlike any other love. And the world perhaps will say, I want to be like that. Where is that type of brotherhood, that type of love come from? And it comes from Jesus Christ. Let me close this in a, in a word of prayer as we close with chapter 13 of the book of Romans. Lord, thank you for loving us, Lord, and thank you for the great reminder today that you are still God. Even when our governments and our authorities, dear Lord, do not behave like, like we're founded on Christian values, when they do not behave like Christians, Lord, remind us today, Lord, that we have our sight set on something far greater. Lord, help us to love our neighbors. Help us to be mindful of the end days, dear Lord, and to live our life, dear Lord, uh, unblemished by the sin that we live in, dear Lord, but to clothe ourselves in the light of you. Lord, thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for this time of the year, Lord, where we can recognize the birth of our Savior. Lord, be with our congregation, and thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.